of verse 27 through 33. The title of my message is simply this. His strength is your strength. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that your word will not return unto you void. But it will accomplish that which you desire it to accomplish. And Father, as I stand behind this desk and open up your word of life, bless your word. Bless your word, Father. Let it speak to the hearts of these precious people listening. And I give you the praise and I give you the glory. For in myself I can't do it, but you can. Because I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And I thank you, Father, that your strength is my strength. I give you thanks. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. John, the 16th chapter. Let's read from verse 27. I'm reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. For the Father himself tenderly loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from my Father. Of course, this is Jesus speaking. I came out from the Father and have come unto the world again. I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Again, I'm leaving the world. In verse 29, his disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly to us and not in parables, not in veiled language and figures of speech. Now we know that you are acquainted with everything and have no need to be asked questions. Because of this, we believe that you freely came really rather, came from God. In verse 31, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Do you believe it at last? I wonder sometimes, I'll stop for a moment, how many times the Lord has spoken that to us and we didn't even know it. Do you really believe? <laughs> Do you really believe it at last? But take notice, he said, the hour is coming and it has arrived when you will all be dispersed and scattered, every man to his own home, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. How many of you know, beloved, that you're never alone? Can I see the hands of the people in here today that say, yes, all over this place, we're never alone. Just like Jesus said, if the Father is with him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is with the church. We're never alone. You may feel lonely, but you're never alone. He goes on to say, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world... You have tribulation, and you'll have trials, and distress, and frustration. I underscored that word in my Bible. How many of you have felt frustrated lately? Come on, am I in a church that tells the truth? Okay, that's why I underscored it. But be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Take courage. Be confident, certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I, this is what I love more than anything in the amplified version of this. I have deprived it. What is he talking about? I have deprived. There's no more power in any of this. There's no more power in tribulation, trials, distress, and frustration. I have deprived it of its power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Wow. That's the words of the Lord, the Master, your Savior. 
He's telling us, yes, there's going to be seasons of our lives that we wish we didn't have to walk through. We wish we could wake up in the morning and it was just a bad nightmare. But guess what, beloved? It's life. And each and every one of us, sooner or later, will go through the exact same things that Jesus is saying. We'll have tribulation. We'll be dispersed. I mean, people, as I'm speaking right now, there's people all over this globe that are dying this very moment for their faith. They're being dispersed. They're being scattered all over the world. And you and I here in the United States of America can thank God and be grateful for the freedoms that we have. And we need to pray we don't lose them. Amen. Amen? That we can come into this building. We call a church, but it's you, the church. And if the church ever had to go underground, how strong will we be? But we, the church, gather together here because we believe in a God we have not yet seen. But we believe in him. We believe he's real. We believe he sent Jesus. We believe Jesus died. We believe Jesus rose again. And because he lives, we shall live also. We believe by faith. Here in, in, in John 16, 33, he says this, These things I've spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take courage, because I've overcame it. I've taken the power out of it. Yes, we say this scripture all the time, no weapon formed against me can ever prosper. And I believe that. But many times that weapon is formed, beloved. And it's during the forming of the weapon, when you know that the, what reality looks like, that you have to say it may be there, but it can't prosper. It may be formed, but it doesn't have the power because Jesus took the power out of it. That's what I just read to you. An essential part of trusting God is relishing his peace. Let me tell you, beloved, there's nothing like the peace of God. The peace of God that passes all understanding. That's what the scripture talks about, his grace. His grace will be sufficient for us. His grace, his love, his anointing, his peace. This is where many people struggle. If the truth be known, we say we trust God. And come on, if we're honest about it. But we have problems remaining calm. We have problems embracing the fact that he is in control. How different our lives would be if we truly understood this. And I'm talking to me, beloved, above all. Trust me. This is the big thing that I struggle with. He's in control, not Pat McKinnon. He's in control. And he tells me all the time, hands off. You just, your job is to pray and believe that you receive. Your job is to call those things that be not as though they were. My job is to do the rest. Unless the Lord build the house, we labor in vain. Unless the Lord watch over the, the city, the watchmen watch in vain. So when we say the house, we can be talking about a church. We can be talking about your home at home. But the Bible's talking about your house being this house. Unless the Lord build this house, we labor in vain. The only thing that builds the house is the word of God. That's it. Bottom line, end of subject. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby. The sincere milk of the word. So... I titled this message, His Strength is Your Strength. If we understood this, if we understood that He knows what He's doing, we would live our lives differently. And I'm talking about myself, believe me. Can you imagine what your day and my day would look like if we no longer, if we no longer would allow the issues to determine our attitude or our outlook. For most of us, we've forgotten that the race is over. 
Jesus paid it all. We've already won because of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that can truly devastate us because God has already defeated everything. Everything that could harm us permanently, he's already defeated, including death. He's defeated death. We will taste of death should the, the Lord tarry and the rapture doesn't take place in the meantime, but we will never die. Our spirits will leave our bodies, but he conquered death. We, for the Christian, there is no such a thing as death. We live eternally. We are actually living in eternity right now as Christians. Right now. We're in this world, the Bible says, but we're not of it. We're not of it. So we're living eternally right now. And when that day comes, when our spirit man leaves our body, we just continue to live in eternity, but it's in a different place. It's then in the presence of God that our physical bodies could not handle. We could not handle the glory of God. It would consume us. But the day will come when we will translate from this world to the next. But Jesus already took care of all of this. There's nothing that can truly devastate us anymore. Nothing, even death. Because we know you know, many of us have, have lost loved ones. You know my own story, and I'm being honest with you, it's 11 years now since Pastor Dave went to his reward. Yes, the, the pain subsides and gets easier, but the memories are always there. And thank God for the good ones. Thank God. But I can honestly stand here and tell you that through this last period of, my ta of the time that I've missed him, Always in my heart, I feel he's with the Lord. So you see, death didn't win. It's what I'm trying to say. It's the blessed hope, exactly, that we will never taste of death. As I said earlier, our spirits will leave our bodies someday. But it's only a transition. Oh, glory to God. You know, I just preached me happy. Seriously, if we could get a hold of this, you just listen. Sometimes we listen to a minister just ministering. And we think, uh, uh, you know, we don't get it. If we could get what I just said, nothing else would matter. Yes, there'll be grief will come through. There's always going to be these things if, if you live long enough. But even in the midst of grief, he says, be still and know that I am God. Be still, and the key to that verse of Scripture is, and know that I am God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So our pain, beloved, and our challenges are only temporary. They are not final. Hold on. Hold on, as I said last week, to the power of hope. Don't ever lose that. It's like a movie script that's been leaked to the public. We already know the outcome. It's one that empowers Christ's followers if only we really embrace this fact. More people might take a risk in life. They wouldn't cling to false securities or, or live in fear. Or our presence in this world as the church would be more than just noticed by others. It would be felt. Beloved Christian today, if, I, if you don't hear another thing I'm saying, please hear this. Lift your head up. Push your worries aside. And let God's peace fill your spirit. You've already got the victory. You're already victorious. We live from victory, not from defeat, because of the finished work on Calvary's tree. Nothing can keep you down permanently. You may have your moments. We've all been there. But nothing can keep you down permanently. His strength is your strength. Therefore, Jesus says to you, do not worry about your life. 
what you will eat or what you will drink or what you'll put on your body. All of these things he's going to take care of. Is life not more than food and, and the body more than clothing? I just quoted to you Matthew 6.25. God wants us free from worry. Worry is a torment. When you're worrying about something, the truth is, you know, the, the presence of doubt is there when you're worrying. I want to ask you a question. Is your heart full of worries today? Are you worried about your health, your finances, your family, or your future? Even when all is well, there are some people that still worry. My mother used to say, she said, there's some folk in this life that's no happy. I'm speaking in Scottish now. That's no happy unless they're, they're worrying. You know people like that, so do I. Don't let you be one. I don't want to be one. I want to try my very best to live my life to the fullest, to believe God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, do I have my moments? Of course I have my moments. You do too. But we don't need to stay there. You're not a failure if you fall down. You're a failure if you stay down. You've got to get back up, dust yourself off, and start all over again and say, God, forgive me. You hear my frustration? i got to vent. Well, the best person you can vent to is God. Believe me. And he'll say to you at the end of your venting, are you done? And you'll meekly say, yes, sir. Good. Now open up your Bible. Just got somebody there. I know I did. So some people will worry about things that haven't even happened yet. They'll worry about everything. There are some people that worry when everything's peaceful because they think that something's wrong because the devil's leaving them alone. How do you like to live like that? I'm serious. I, I have had people say these things to me. Oh, I, I, I've had a good day today. Oh, you did? That's nice. Yeah, the devil left me alone today. Hallelujah. I thought they were going to say, well, God gave me a revelation from the Word. Oh, hallelujah. I'm not saying you can't be under an attack. We, we know different. But we also know we won. We don't win. Read the book of Revelation. We won. We won the battle through Christ. We won through the finished work. Nothing can change that. The enemy knows the power in the name of Jesus and the blood of the Lamb. That's your testimony. I believe I said that to you last week, but it's coming back up in my spirit again. Yes, it's wonderful to say you've been delivered from this, that, and the next thing, and God healed you from this, that, and the next thing. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I'm not putting that down. But you better know what your testimony is in the day when he tries to attack you. Your testimony is no way, devil. No way. I don't care what it looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like, what it touches like. I don't care. You can't do this. I am in Christ. Here's my testimony. I overcome you with the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony that says he paid the price. You can't touch that bloodline. The blood is against you, devil. The blood, you can't touch it. You can't cross that line. That's when you're given your testimony of who you are in Christ if any man or person be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And it goes on to say that you have became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's your testimony. And it's because of his strength that you can be strong. You can't do this on your own. None of us can. But when you know who you are, 
And I'm not saying there won't be times when you'll fail and and go into self-pity and all of these things. Believe me, I've been there more times than I want to be honest about. But I've had enough sense to get myself back up and get myself by the ear. And I look at myself in the mirror and I talk to me and I say, enough already, enough. Go put on some praise music. Hallelujah, because you can't shout and doubt at the same time. And when you're giving God praise, when you're in the midst of hell, that's when God shows up. And that's when the devil runs. He doesn't understand those kind of Christians. He doesn't understand why we can praise God in the midst of what we're going through. He doesn't understand that. So... We need to be peaceful because God's gave us his peace. And as I said, some people just have to find something to worry about. But Jesus does not want you and I to worry. He doesn't want us to worry about what we'll eat or drink, about our body, what we'll put on it. He tells us not to worry. He tells us that he will provide Spirit, soul, and body. God, who is your heavenly Father, knows that you need of all of these things. And he wants to add these things to you. I said to you last week, and I'll repeat it, God is the same God who took care of the children of Israel in the wilderness. He fed them with manna every day for 40 years. You can read that for yourself in Exodus, the 16th chapter. Under his care, now listen, under his care, his people had no lack. And when the people wanted meat for dinner, I mean, they were never satisfied, just like today, we're never satisfied. We're tired of this manna. We want some different. Well, God gave them quail. And he told them, he said, all you have to do is pick them up. If they had gone to look for meat for themselves, how could they have found meat in the middle of the desert? No. God provided for them. You see, beloved, the problem with us is, and this is the truth, we think that we must do something to help ourselves and to help God. Now, I'm not saying you don't make quality decisions and and all of these things to help yourself. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that when we're constantly trying to be God, to help in God, like he doesn't know what he's doing, I've got a news flash for you. When he said, let there be light, he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing when he breathed into Adam the breath of life and man became a living soul. He knew exactly what he was doing when he put you in your mother's womb. He knew exactly when you would be born. He knew exactly the country you would spend your life in. He knew exactly the the years of your life. He knows exactly what he is doing God's not fooled by any of us. God sees our hearts and you can thank him that he does. Or most of us would be dust. If we still lived under the old covenant, we wouldn't have a snowball's chance in hell. Are you hearing me? Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God we're not under that law. We're under the spirit. The letter of the law killeth, but the spirit of God giveth life through the word. When you read the word, they are God's promises to you because he put everything on Jesus for you. Every diabolical infirmity was put on the master. Every disease, every sickness, Everything that you and I deal with on a daily basis was put on Jesus. 
Oh, hallelujah. So the problem is, though, we think we have to help God. He's not going fast enough for us. Or he's not doing it the way we thought. Come on now, we're all there. You can say amen or oh me, but it's the truth. And the one word that we say constantly is why, God? Why? Why? Well, I'm here to tell you, beloved, I'd love to tell you why. But there's none of us, God. God didn't die and, and put me in control. We don't understand everything. But that's when we have to believe. That's when we have to trust. That's when we have to praise him. That's when we have to do what Abraham did and call those things as be not as though they were. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness sake. We became righteous through Jesus. We did nothing to deserve it. Nothing. But accept Jesus as our savior. Wow, what a savior. What a savior. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. So don't worry. Don't take all these thoughts about your life. What's going to happen today? What's going to happen tomorrow? What am I going to be doing next week? Well, see, these are the things that I have to train myself not to do. Because my mind naturally is in next year already. I'm serious. And I have to pull myself back. Whoa, Bessie, get back here. That's what Pastor Dave used to say to me all the time. We called all of our cars Bessie. <laughs> and he would say, whoa, Bessie. And then he would look at me, I'm talking to you, he'd say. But, you see, humor's okay, isn't it? The joy of the Lord is our strength. So, we act like he doesn't understand the problems that we face in life. But the truth is, beloved, Jesus understands the problems more than we know he does. He faced what I would call the final problem, death. Death is the final problem because it puts an end to all of our, all of our other problems. Jesus faced death on that cross. He conquered it. He rose again. And because he conquered the problem of problems, we can trust him when he tells us not to worry. His strength is your strength. Rely on him. Get out of yourself for a few minutes and rely on him. But understand this, beloved. Let me remind you of this important fact. Now, we're not talking about the devil, you know, attacking us every five minutes of every day. Listen, there's all kinds of things that happen in your life and my life. Maybe we made the wrong choices and brought about some things and we're saying, oh, the devil did this. No, 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 you did it. There's no demons and doorknobs, okay? So I'm trying to say something to you, beloved. Hopefully it gets through. There will be times when it is the enemy. Not always, but it will, there will be. And that's when discernment comes in. That's when you have to discern what is the bottom line here. And you'll find many, many times it's because you're on the front lines. And there's assignments sent from the pit of hell. But Jesus overcame those assignments. Are you hearing me today? Bless the Lord. So I want to give you this important fact. Hallelujah. The warfare over your life today, my life, your life, everybody's life, is an indication of your value to God. The attack that you're sustaining is because you have the ability to score in this game. If your assignment is of God, you'll attract attack like a magnet. Let me give you some examples. Before the Apostle Paul reached his destiny, he wrote these words. I have had to forge rivers 
fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I have been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by the desert sun and sea storm, and betrayed by those I thought were my brothers. I have known drudgery. I've known hard labor. I've had many a long and lonely night without sleep, many a missed meal, been blasted by the cold, naked to the weather, and that is not the half of it when you throw in the daily pressures and anxieties of all of the churches. You say, is that in the Bible? Read it for yourself, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 26. The Apostle Paul knew what this attack was about in his life. He knew it went a lot deeper than any eye could see or any ear could hear. You see, we have spiritual insight. We are not dealing with flesh and blood principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. But you walk in the light, beloved. You walk in the light of God's word. And when you speak the word, every demon in hell has to flee. Because the word of God is God's bond. The word of God is God. In the word, in the beginning was the word. And the word was God. In the beginning, the word is God. And it hasn't changed. So then the apostle Paul goes on to say, listen, hallelujah. You talk about, um, oh, you talk about faith. I'm looking forward someday, not too soon, but I'm looking forward someday to seeing Paul. There's Paul and there's Peter, the two Ps. That's the two I want to see, Paul and Peter. Listen to what Paul said. Now listen, he says, Forget those things which are behind and go forward to those things which are ahead. He's telling them all, all of these terrible things that's happened to him. And he's saying, but I'm forgetting them. Now I'm going to say something to you that I've believed for many years. I doubt very seriously if Paul forgot anything. I believe that he could remember the names he could remember the places. He could remember the faces. And he even recorded it all. But there's a difference in what I just said. Listen carefully. Paul refused to let the hurts done to him affect his outlook on life. He refused to let these things keep him from finishing his course with joy. Don't let your past rob you of your future, beloved. Let the past be the past. Yesterday ended at midnight. Close the door and move on with God. And believe for better things today. And when you're in today, believe for better things coming for tomorrow. And if they don't, then just get on your face before God and pray and trust God. Because he's still there. We might not think so sometimes, but he's still there. Maybe today you feel hopeless. You know you've been looking only at the natural circumstances, beloved. You've been looking at so many negative things that are in your life at this time. I pray today that God would help you to change your focus and start seeing the positive things that he already has in store for you. I believe that as you trust him and keep a positive imagination, as I was teaching a few weeks ago, hope will start motivating you and driving you once again towards God. Let his strength be your strength. But let me just start to wrap this up because I want to say something to you. This is important. Maybe, just maybe, we all need some more foundation work done. Just maybe. Foundation work. When I was reading my notes this morning, Brother Will, I thought about your discipleship course. A lot of us need to get back to foundations. How we, you know, especially when we were first born again, 
I remember I could believe God for it. And I'm telling you, I had very little waiting period between believing and receiving. It just seemed to, just seemed to be like that. In my mind, it was like that. I'm sure it was a little bit longer. But what happens is, as you grow in the Lord and you hear this kind of teaching and that kind of teaching and hear this one's advice and that one's advice, and you start to feel the water's getting muddied somehow. We need to get back to simplistic faith. Faith that worketh by love. Faith that cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And faith that is activated by hope. So maybe we need some foundation work. Building on solid ground, building on a solid rock, takes patience and hard work. Whereas building on sand is easier, it's cheaper, and it provides instant comfort for us. But it also places you at the mercy of the elements. And when the storms arise, and they will, it's easy to tell what kind of foundation that your life is built upon. One that's undergirded by prayer and steeped in God's word, that life will withstand the winds that blow, the winds that blow others away. When a foundation is inadequate for a building, listen to what will happen. Its walls crack, its roof sags, and eventually it will collapse. No matter what you're trying to build, beloved, whether it be a business, a ministry, a relationship, anything, don't rush. Give it time. Slow and steady, not fast and fleeting. Give it time. There are no shortcuts to maturity, whether it be naturally speaking or spiritually speaking. Everything is in its season of God. Hallelujah. The most lasting relationships start out gradually. Actually, some of the strongest people you know at one time or another needed help to overcome many weaknesses in their lives. And you're looking at one. And I'm still not overcame. I have still have not overcame them all but I'm working on them. That's the main thing. A well-known pastor who asked God to increase his ministry writes the following. After days of silence, the Lord answered my prayer. Praise God. The Lord answered my prayer by saying, you're concerned about building a ministry. I'm concerned with building a man. Woe to the man whose ministry becomes bigger than he is. You see, a ministry is not built on knowledge, although that's part of it. A ministry that's going to stand the test of time is built on integrity and character. And those two substances take a long time to mature. He goes on to say, since then, I've concerned myself more with praying for the minister than the ministry. I'm still amazed at who I'm becoming as I put my life daily into his hands. He's changing me, and he's not finished yet. There is so much more that needs to be done. Every day, I see more immaturity in me. But what a sharp contrast I am now to what I was. I trust him more than ever. He's just too wise to make a mistake. So take the time, and I add, take the time, beloved, to build God's truths into your foundation, and life's storms will not uproot you, because his strength will always be your strength. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you and we praise you, O oh God, and we give you the glory. I have spoken forth your word as you directed me to, Lord, and I pray that your people have received your word. I give you the praise today for your goodness, for your graciousness, for your faithfulness. 
I'm forever grateful for the cross. Forever grateful, Lord. I speak out to the congregation now and I say, if there be one here today that does not know you, Jesus, you do not know Jesus as your Savior. You've been a good person. You've lived your life in a decent way. But you've never said, Jesus, come into my life. I want you to be my Savior today. If there be one here today that would say, I need, I need Jesus. Or maybe you're here today and you're saying, I know Jesus, but I need to. I need to come a lot closer to the Lord. I know that. I know that. I need to rededicate my life to him. If there be one anywhere that would say yes to any of those two invitations, I just ask you to raise your hand quickly, put it right back down again. God bless you. I see, wow, quite a few hands. Yes. Yes, Lord. I'll give you a moment. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. God sees your hearts today, especially those. He sees all of us, but in particular the what we're doing right now, he saw those hands that went up. He saw those hearts. And he loves you unconditionally. So today, if we could just pray this together, beloved, if we can. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I thank you that as I confess my sins, he's quick and just to forgive me to bring me into the body of Christ. And this day, I receive you as my Savior, Jesus. And today, I make you my Lord. And for those of you that want that closer walk, let all of us say this together. We all need to, myself included. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I thank you for my great salvation. And I give you the praise today that by your grace and your help and your strength, I will become stronger and stronger in my faith and in, and in everything that I can do for others to help you to bring this world to Christ. Hear my heart, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And God bless you, beloved. Thank you.